start with the next item on the agenda, I think. I hope you can all hear me well. Um, so what we're going to talk about next is all jobs with new twists. So we have a couple of uh, uh, people from industry and research are going to talk to us about these new twists in these old jobs. And we're very happy to have them here. I've heard that one of the people that was supposed to speak actually couldn't make it. Uh, so we'll have a little bit more time, but I've asked everybody to stick to a couple of like 10 minutes each and uh, each of them will also do their own inter uh, introduction. So I won't uh, spend time on introductions now. So I think the first speaker in the row is Nicola. Hello, everyone. I'm Nicola uh, from the European Institute in Slovenia, and I'm a researcher in the area of natural language processing, computational linguistics and computational social science. And I regularly work with linguists, and in this 10-minute presentation, I will share some of my thoughts on uh, what I would like from the linguists to have as simple as possible. So first, I will um, do a very, very short introduction to what natural, natural language processing actually requires nowadays. We all heard a lot about machine learning and artificial intelligence, so this is the main uh, the main uh, methodology used nowadays in natural language processing. So how we manage to train computers to understand language or to deal with language related tasks is to give them examples uh, where a specific task has been solved. So we have a simple sentence here. And for instance, if we want to do part of speech thing, then we are supposed to give the computer um, something that we called training data. And we obtain this training data by organizing annotation campaigns where we hire linguists. And in these annotation campaigns, the linguists perform these annotations. And then we, tra we use this training data to train systems via machine learning methods. And then we, um, and those systems are then capable of doing automatic annotation of the data that has previously been unseen. Just to set the scene for everybody to understand what we are talking about. Okay, uh, so I think uh, in my understanding, there are three types of problems that we are solving in natural language processing. First of all, we have a linguistic problem, something like part of speech tagging, syntactic analysis that you could have seen in the previous slides. Then we have something that we regularly call end-to-end -end problems. So where there's, there is no linguistic analysis in between. For instance, hate speech detection, machine translation, speech to text systems, question answering, text summarization. Most of this is done without any explicit linguistic analysis in between. And then we have a third type of task that we are more and more uh, active in, and this is model benchmarking. So nowadays you might have heard that uh, these huge, very clever models, but we need to understand as much as possible on what these models are capable and not are, cap are not capable of. So we do a lot of this as well. And linguists are needed. So in the case of linguistic problems, we need them for manual annotation of training data, and but also for error analysis. For the end-to-end -end problems, we need them primarily for error analysis, while in the third case of model benchmarking, we need them for benchmark construction and also error analysis. And in this short talk, I will actually focus on one example of manual annotation of training data and one example of uh, benchmark construction. So back to uh, dependency parsing. So most of you might have heard about the Universal Dependencies Project. So something that we do very frequently with linguists is do annotation of data on the level of morphosyntax and dependency parsing. So what we require from these annotators are strong theoretical backgrounds in morphology and syntax, if possible in multiple theories, because what we really need is flexibility. What we have observed many times in not that uh, uh, good annotators is they stick to something they have learned during their studies and what they're considered to be correct. But we have something that we call annotation guidelines, and those are supposed to be followed as much as possible. Uh, especially there are also, of course, as we know in languages, complicated. So we have so many edge cases where things could go this or that direction. And then it is super important to stick to the annotation guidelines. For the second example, benchmarking. So I will just also, this is uh, the reason for me to show this to you is also to show roughly the state of the art in uh, natural language processing and understanding, which is rather uh, drastic. There has been drastic improvements recently. So we have something, a uh, data set that's called the choice of plausible alternatives. This data set is supposed to measure how well these big models cover common sense causal reasoning. So uh, one example that we, uh, so, uh, the, the example that we give to the computer to solve, for instance, if you have the premise, the man broke his toe, what was the cause of this? And then we uh, give the computer two alternatives and the computer is supposed to choose the most plausible one. 
One alternative is he got a hole, he got a hole in his sock. And the other alternative is he dropped a hammer on his foot. I guess all of us agree that the second alternative is much more plausible. Uh, so such um, a benchmarking uh, tests have been uh, almost uh, impossible to solve in 2013 on English. In 2019, we were already at 70% of accuracy. And nowadays, computers are able to solve such tests almost perfectly. So there has been huge improvement just to put this forward. And what we do, we do hire translators nowadays very frequently. Linguists and translators also have as much uh, background in natural language processing as well to translate such benchmarks. Because the idea is not to benchmark only English data sets of course, and English models, but also models uh, built on, uh, in other languages. So on one side, the translator is supposed to uh, translate following, again, translation guidelines, but also provide feedback if something uh, is not covered in the translation guidelines, feedback is supposed to be given. And uh, translation guidance are supposed to be improved. And also in this case, uh, the translator is also supposed to take the test himself uh, so that he's primed on the task that he's dealing with, but also to test for cultural bias. Because nowadays we are aware that, of course, in different cultures, uh, uh, what is most plausible could be different. And to uh, sum up on the skills that I consider to be required, at least for these two tasks that I have put forward, for linguistic annotation, we need strong theoretical background, but we also need flexibility to apply a specific theory of formalism that, that has been chosen on that project. With all its imperfections, we know and there is no formalism that perfectly describes the language, but we just have to skip to one, with one because computers are not that smart to understand uh, our ambiguity. So we want to be non-ambiguous in the instruction that we give to the computers. And also what I consider now that's very important is training in setting up annotation guidelines and running annotation campaigns. So this is more and more done. And if a linguistic co um, um, course had such uh, skills given, this would be, I think, of great uh, use. And for benchmarking, here things are a little bit more complicated. So if anybody was in, uh, capable of doing benchmarks for testing the, these uh, new uh, language models, we would need uh, them to have strong theoretical backgrounds to understand what language models should be able to do, how to measure how they're good at, at the specific phenomena, et cetera. We would also need them to have good understanding of the types of models currently out there, at least general understanding of their inner wordings, and again, I can assess this enough, strict following annotation translation guidelines with feedback once we have this. And maybe to uh, finish up on a positive note, so I know that Fred, what Fred Jelinek said uh, half a century ago, but nowadays I would be pretty sure that most of the NLP researchers would agree with the content that I have put into this slide. So every time I hire a properly trained linguist, the performance of my system actually goes up. I understand better what my system is, uh, what the system decisions are best based on. I know what my system is good and what it is bad at, and identify promising directions for to further improve my system. So thank you for listening. Thanks a lot. Thanks. That was very, uh, very interesting and also very encouraging as well, especially the last line. I really like that. Um, so we have a bit of time for questions. So if people, I, I'll have a look at the chat. Um, I see mostly people thanking and people giving some extra information. Is there maybe somebody who wants to ask a question and they can do that now? If not, I'll start with one question. So what I found interesting is that you started every time for the different task with you need a very good uh, theoretical background for the linguist. And uh, I, I think that uh, often people think that maybe that's not so necessary. We can just have somebody who is a speaker of a certain language and they don't need a theoretical uh, background of, of a particular language. So they don't need an actual linguistic training. Can you say something about that? Yes, yes. I mean, I, I don't think this stands. It depends, of course, on of the problem. If we are dealing with an end-to-end -end problem, as I call those, where we're, for instance, just supposed to classify documents into specific categories, then you're just supposed to stick to the annotation guidelines. But if we do any sort of linguistic annotation or linguistic probing, then I think a theoretical background is crucial. Because mm -hmm. we are dealing with highly complex phenomena here, and it is not just enough to know how to read annotation guidance because these are also never perfect we always improve them as we work on a project and we need uh, use of uh, the annotators feedback to be mm -hmm. sure that we get the annotations and the formalism applied as good as possible 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw also from the examples that you gave that actually, yeah, you really need to think hard to, to see what you think the computer should be able to do and whatnot, especially for the benchmarking. So thanks a lot, Nicola. Let's go to the next speaker. So given that Matteo, I think, couldn't make it, um, I think the next, next speaker up would be Lorenzo. Is Lorenzo there? Hello, good morning, everyone. Ah, and, uh, great. <laughs> thank you, and thanks for having me today. Okay, let me... Let me share my screen. It's a great pleasure to be here today with you. Um, my name is Lorenzo Musetti. I am head of the expert.ai Academy. Um, knowledge and learning are my mantras. Of course, I, you know, one of my main, let's, let's say my core businesses, among my core businesses, there is, of course, training and coaching professionals in using NLP and NLU technologies. I have a background in cognitive sciences, so I am not properly a linguist. But I joined expert.ai uh, you know, quite a few years ago uh, as a knowledge engineer or a computational linguist. So just a quick, very quick introduction on, on uh, expert.ai. Expert.ai is an international company. We have uh, many headquarters around uh, the world. And what we do is we produce NLU technologies. NLU technologies are basically we could say it's a type of NLP technology. What we do more in, you know, in respect to NLP technologies is that NLU, so natural language understanding, uh, concerns and let's say, um, you know, treats the aspect of understanding language. So understanding the meaning of every single word that we produce in a, in a, you know, in a human interaction, in a human conversation. So uh, we are now transitioning from being a company that not only produces technology, we are also, we, we, we are also you know, creating solutions for our customers. And we are now transitioning to become uh, actual um, technology vendors. So basically our vision is to make everyone an expert and uh, propelling, supporting the process of digital transformation. Um, so to bring technology to anyone, to any users that want to employ technology and uh, our mission is to create technology that transforms language into insight now this is important i thought that it was important also to introduce how critical how crucial the the role of a linguist of a knowledge engineer is in this process as you see i've always been talking about linguistics and language somehow in the in what i was saying earlier and that is because knowledge engineers and linguists whether they are real linguists or uh, computational linguists they are the key factor in most of the r d and technical teams in expert.ai we have knowledge engineers in r d and what they take over are tasks for technology research and development support processes of innovation on technology uh, perform competitive intelligence as well so no, for instance, a computational linguist knowing many technologies can be crucial for the company to learning for more learning more from other competitors as well. And also um, support advocacy processes. So connecting with with um, with experts and talk about NLP. Um, professional services is another type of team. It's probably the biggest team we have in the company right now. And what they do is basically the way they leverage linguists in the production of AI-based solutions that we deploy to customers' premises. So there is a huge work in contact with, part with, uh, with partners and customers in the effort of creating solutions that would automate or accelerate specific processes at the company's premise. Just think about you know, how many emails uh, and, you know, a corporate or you know, a big enterprise receives and sends every day being able to classify those emails for supporting specific tasks is crucial it's incredibly valuable uh, there is a huge portion of project management as well many of our knowledge engineers coming from a linguists uh, a linguistics type of background they they often become project management especially if they show uh, you know, organization skills <clears throat> sorry the academy is the third team. Uh, most of the effort in the academy team is, of course, technical training, but advocacy and evangelism type of tasks don't miss. So we also connect with professionals, coach them, talk with them, and then show what we do and bring that, you know, to to have to leverage what we do at our company. So joining meetups, uh, meeting, you know, professionals, professors, students at university, as well, including, for instance, 
consulting tasks and training management processes, which is basically very similar to the project management part. But the only difference is that in professional services, you would deliver a project or a solution and within the academy you would deliver let's say an engaging professional training so just to give a little bit of more detail on what knowledge engineers do in r d they support the creation of huge um, knowledge graphs the knowledge graphs are definitely one of the you know of the core components of our technology we have different knowledge graphs uh, for you know all the different languages we treat and they are all curated and maintained and made perfect by teams of knowledge engineers and linguists. This is critical if you think about it, you know, a deep understanding, a professional level of understanding of linguistics and of foreign language is critical for a test like this one. And uh, what, you know, in R&D, they also, so linguists also support linguistics based tasks as well, as well as, for instance, research for driving technology and innovation we are a technology that analyzes you know language and so competence and proficiency in linguistics you know it's it's a game changer in innovation um, creating innovative features for instance for our natural language processing products is crucial uh, there is one colleague that i'm not sure if he could make it to the meeting but he he leads the team a team of knowledge engineers so linguists that actually create uh, language driven features that then are published to many of our products that are free to use out there and that actually are employed by our customers. There is also, you know, a big portion of, uh, you know, articles, publications, research, you know, sharing research outcomes and support competitive intelligence and business analysis. Just to mention a few tasks, uh, you know, of course, supporting innovation and technology, supporting research, Data annotation is for sure, you know, a, a big task, one of the big technical tasks. Uh, NLP programming is not missing. Machine learning and machine le learning operations are crucial tasks for many development type of processes. Again, sharing publications and, uh, you know, uh, let's say performing data and, and business analysis. Within the professional services, Again, uh, we have a big portion of project management. So many of our uh, knowledge engineers and linguists that become project, uh, project managers because they have a complete understanding of you know, the role of linguistics and how to leverage and make it perfect for delivering, uh, you know, performing and value added services. Uh, and a linguist would usually otherwise join technical teams that are led by project managers. And as I said earlier, basically the linguists work together in international teams around the globe uh, to work together and develop, uh, you know, services, AI based services that then are, you know, delivered to the customers. So the type of work that a linguist would do is not only data annotation, our technology also, you know, our technology centers the human in the process of producing AI that brings value. And so knowledge engineers are not just there to annotate data, they are there also to script linguistic algorithms that the, the machine uses to understand how to classify text or to extract specific text from, uh, you know, contracts, emails, or other types of NLP tasks that are very typical of this business. Um, again, Typical tasks are solution design. So supporting the technical team in designing solutions that include AI and bring value to business. Uh, data annotation, NLP programming, machine learning and, and machine learning operations are again, you know, crucial. As Nicola said, uh, you know, machine learning is one of the most trending techniques in the production of NLP solutions. And project management, of course, is not missing. On the academy side, uh, most of our effort is on training so coaching professionals and working closely with developers data scientists computational linguists and students so driving technology evangelism activities is crucial as well we want people to know our technology to use it to play around with it and also you know publishing all the articles and the research outcomes that you know we we produce and we run in the team as well as sharing NLP models and modules that we produce within the team to share with the community out there and uh, uh, organize technical courses for professionals and make them uh, an engaging professional experience. 
So common tasks are, you know, the actual process of training, uh, you know, teams of professionals and students, training, designing the training experience, managing and organizing the training, um, perform technology research and publications, you know, meet uh, people, uh, join meetups and talk and discuss about technology with other, you know, passionate technologists. And then NLP programming and machine learning operations, as well as consulting tasks. So just to run a final remark, remarks aspect. So uh, computational linguistics and linguistics overall, if you, you know, if you listen closely, I've been mentioning linguistics all the time. And that is because expert.ai is heavily based on linguists. So linguists are, you know, one of the biggest and most important cores of our company and know-how. And it's not just about computational linguistics. So um, of course, computational linguistics are crucial and we, we, you know, we hire many computational linguists, but also we've been hiring linguists that would then learn the, the, uh, the parts of the computational linguistics that they need for joining the R&D team or the uh, professional services team or the academy team, for instance. And, uh, you know, but, you know, as, a, as we produce technologies that leverage linguistics, you know, um, linguistics is one of the crucial aspects that we want to onboard in our company. And foreign languages is, of course, crucial, not only because you will, you know, uh, our linguists work with inter within international teams, but it's also because we are building technologies that uh, master different types of languages. Uh, and so, you know, it's important to be able to bring this language knowledge to factor so that, you know, that uh, will actually improve and, and give into the improvement of the quality of our technology processing. Um, just a few additional things, curiosity, creativity and passion. Those are definitely things that we look in the people, in the new students joining the company. It's it's incredibly valuable people there are so many knowledge engineers and linguists that we've been hiring that brought such you know uh, power energy to the teams and that was proven to be a value added and it's actually contagious so people with a great passion they really bring a value added to any of the teams that they joined and one message to all the students in linguistics the future is yours we're you know we're undergoing a process of transformation or digital transformation and in this process, there will be a point where um, democratizing technology will be crucial for bringing technology to anyone. And that will not exclude the linguists. If you think about it, uh, you know, since language and language technologies are so becoming more and more important in the, in the business, in the industry, linguists learning the know-how and, and gaining the experience in, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in building AI-driven solutions will be critical for this process of digital transformation. And also an aspect about community, the internet gave us the opportunity to reduce distance. And I think that there are so many communities out there already with students, professionals, and even just people that maybe they do different jobs, but they're so passionate about linguistics. My invite is to go out there and talk with these people and learn more about, you know, linguistics outside of, of industry and outside of university. There's an incredible world out there and, you know, it's really worth connecting with this. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Lorenzo. That was very interesting. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, in, um, chat. Uh, activity so uh, there are actually quite a number of questions we won't be able to go through them all at the moment maybe at the end of this talk because i want to give the other speakers also some time but if you are still here in the afternoon do you think you would be able to be there uh, during our interactive session still yes yeah, so, yeah? Oh, yeah oh that's perfect so then i'll just ask you one question maybe from mm -hmm. the from the audience so um one thing that they asked is you, you mentioned often that linguists are involved in writing algorithms and scripts does that mean that some programming skills are required and which programming languages should linguists look into in order to work in the field can you say something about that okay so you know if you are a computational linguist coming from you know python or sometimes even java go or javascript that's definitely something that you can leverage in the company but our products 
have uh, you know different approaches to NLP programming, and some of them require um, you know let's I call it linguistic programming. So it's a it's a programming language that anyone can learn, so that they can leverage the linguistics knowledge and bring it to value to the product. So yes. There is a, you know, a part, let's say a portion of your task, especially if you're working with, uh, with the professional services, a portion of your task will be about scripting, so programming uh, linguistic tasks, but it's a type of language that you would learn inside the company. It's a learning process. It's part of the company investing in the person and growing the person in the job. And uh, it's, a, it's a programming language that anyone learns when they enter the company. We even teach customers to, uh, to adopt this language. So it's definitely something that you can take over, even though you don't have uh, you know, a, a computer science background. Perfect. That sounds very encouraging. Okay, so the, the, the remainder of the questions, we'll keep them for the afternoon uh, session. And thanks, uh, Lorenzo, that you can still be there then. Sure. Um, so let's go to the next speaker. Um, Alicia, I think she should be the next speaker. Hello. Are you there? Yeah, okay, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so let me share my screen. Yes. So um, good morning, everyone, and thanks for being here today. Um, my name is uh, Alicia Cipressi and um, I represent uh, the Accolade group. Um, if you are familiar with the language industry, maybe you have heard of Accolade. Um, it is today one of the biggest players in the um, uh, language industry. And uh, we currently have several uh, offices across Europe, North America and uh, Asia. And uh, today we count around uh, 2000 employees. Um, we try to serve our customers locally. That's why uh, we have uh, offices in 25 countries across uh, Europe, uh, North America, and Asia. I'm personally located uh, in, in one of the Italian offices. Um, uh, at Accolade, we have the possibility and the chance to work with so many different uh, cultures. And that's why it uh, promoted the creation of a multicultural DNA where different uh, teams uh, work on the same projects globally. Uh, the chance to work with so many different teams also promoted um, a very collaborative uh, environment uh, that helps the growth and the creativity of our teams. The growth, both professional and personal, is definitely important for us. And that's why we try to organize as much as we can trainings uh, from both uh, internal and external professionals. Um, at Tagalot, we also try to pay uh, attention, uh, great attention uh, to um, balance between career and uh, personal life, in particular in this period. And that's also why uh, we try to promote flexibility and remote working uh, as much as we can. And we try to organize global initiatives for health and well-being. Um, but let's have a look at the main teams uh, we have at Accolade, and uh, I can already anticipate that most of them are fit for linguists. Uh, actually, most of, um, of our colleagues are linguists. They started as internal linguists, and then they ended up in uh, different teams up to DTP or quality, uh, because being such a niche market, um, actually, um, it's in some cases, in many cases, it, it's much more important to have knowledge and experience in this specific industry than specific studies um, in different relevant fields. Um, we are also used to organize collabor uh, collaborations and internships with uh, several universities. Um, this gives us the opportunity to meet several students and to build a pipe of candidates for the future so that we invite them as soon as we have open positions. Um, you will see we have I mean, many um, very well-known teams such as project managers, translators and terminology teams, of course, and salespeople, but also more technical ones like language technology teams, MT teams, uh, DTP, and so on. Um, I am, for instance, an example of the many opportunities that linguists can have in this industry. I started some time ago already, <laughs> right after uh, graduating in translation studies um, as translator. So um, I started with an internship in translator 
in translation. And after 16 years and several roles covered, I'm now uh, head of production uh, of several teams in Southern Europe, Northern Europe, and uh, the Dach region. So just to, to share with you that it's uh, quite easy to change role. And um, I mean, we are flexible enough to do that. Today, I would like to uh, focus on three main um, roles that are perfectly fit for linguists. The first one, uh, it's also a good news if I look at the poll we had before, where many uh, of you actually uh, shared that it would be nice to become a project manager in the past. Um, the project manager is currently one of the most requested roles in the company. Um, up to 60% of the total employees are project managers. Um, project managers are um, a key role uh, because they're actually the ones coordinating all the stakeholders involved uh, in a translation or localization project. Uh, they are the ones receiving uh, new requests, analyzes scope and feasibility of the request, preparing commercial offer for the customer, and once it is accepted, uh, they will select contact and coordinate all the actors needed to complete the project successfully. Um, it's also important for, the, for a project manager to propose improvements in workflows and processes. Uh, let's have a look at the main soft skills that the project manager should have. Um, the project manager should be a clear and effective communicator. Uh, ideally, you should have a smart problem-solving attitude because as a PM, you need to be ready to many last-minute changes. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, a good organizational skills, as we mentioned more than once today. Um, good technical skills are definitely a plus. Um, as you know, in the language industry, technology environment is changing really rapidly. And, and that's why the linguists that already know all um, most of the commercial tools that we have on the market um, are a step ahead. Um, let, um, okay, we also um, noticed lately, uh, we run a, a check among uh, our uh, PMs, both in Europe and in, um, in the US. And uh, we noticed that uh, uh, most of our European project managers have a background in translation studies. Uh, if we look at Italy in particular, 90% uh, of project managers are linguists uh, as a background. And we all, and it is not the same in the US. Um, this, uh, with this in mind, we all agreed uh, that actually being a linguist as a background usually help a lot uh, the project manager to better understand the needs of the customer and the needs of the vendors, so of the uh, professionals involved. And usually the quality that we're able to uh, provide is much higher. So definitely a plus. <laughs> um, let's move to another role, another key role in the, in the group that is vendor manager. Uh, the vendor manager uh, is the one selecting, testing, recruiting, and uh, maintaining um, a big pool of uh, external professionals. Many of them will be translators. Uh, that's also why being uh, a linguist um, will help the VM speaking the same language of the target audience, and um, it will help understanding, in understanding each other much better. Um, Internal um, uh, customers of vendor managers are uh, sales and production teams that usually involves VMs uh, in order to prepare the best possible offer or to prepare the best possible uh, pool of resources uh, to prepare proposals for customer and to win opportunities or to complete properly um, complex translation jobs. Um, vendor managers uh, should be great negotiator for both internal and external uh, stakeholders, uh, effective communicator, and uh, a great problem solver to, I mean, uh, to find with some creativity the good answer to the extreme requests of sales and production teams. 
um, good organizational skills and uh, um, ability in setting priorities will also be a plus for vendor managers so that they uh, manage to handle all the many requests for different services and languages that they receive every single day. Um, last but not least, let's speak about the MT specialist. As we already mentioned today, uh, machine translation is definitely a hot topic in the, in the language industry. And it is expected to stay a hot topic for the years to come. And that's also why we expect a growing need for MT specialists in the near future. Um, the MT specialist has a complete overview on the use of MT, including feasibility studies on MT implementation, MT integration, and uh, proper um, post-editing pricing. Usually a linguist is a very good candidate for this role because uh, in, he or she has the perfect knowledge of all the aspects that make MT successful, such as terminology, the uh, quality of the outputs, uh, but also the complexity of the source text we are analyzing. Um, an MT specialist usually creates and tests an MT engine, and the linguist is a suitable candidate because uh, he is usually able to identify um, which, how a good translation looks like and uh, if a text is eligible or not for machine translation. Um, the MT specialist is also the one supporting and introducing the integration of MT in uh, uh, internal workflows. And here the, the linguist play a central role because um, he or she um, knowing uh, the, um, the needs of the final users, in, in our case, a post editor, um, uh, the, uh, an MT specialist that is also a linguist will help introducing a new tool because he will already know um, the answers and the, for all questions and doubts from the end users. Part of the job of um, an MT specialist is also in research and development because he or she will have to test new tools and new functionalities related to machine translation. Um, and I would stop here for today. Uh, I know we are with a short time, but um, I hope this very quick overview has been interesting for you. I'm open for questions also later and uh, feel free to check our open positions, <laughs> both for interns and uh, employees. Yeah, thank you so much, Alicia. That was very oh, interesting. Yeah. Yes, it, it's very good that you show also our students uh, that are listening, uh, what are the different types of jobs or also the, the job titles, right? Where you, you're, as yeah. a re recent graduate, you, you probably don't think you should apply for vendor, or what was it again? I forgot, vendor manager, right? How would you know? And I think this is very important and something in upskills that we can work on, uh, getting uh, students uh, to realize that there are actually more jobs that they can apply for than they might think. And this is also something I saw in the chat that that's why I'm, I'm mentioning this. Um, yes, are there any more questions? I, I've seen not that many questions. It's more people discussing things that are uh, indeed a result of what you were talking about, but not so many direct questions. If anybody has one, they can post it now. Otherwise, um, maybe we, we can have them later as well. I was surprised that you said 90% of the project managers in Europe are linguists, you were saying, and it's not the case in the US. That was something yeah, I, I was, uh, how, do um, you have an actually, idea why? Um, well, um, probably it's a different culture. Um, if we notice also the um, offices that we have in Europe usually are near translation universities. Uh, and uh, yeah. th there's a direct collaboration between us and uh, universities. So, okay. Yeah, I think it's more a matter of culture. Yeah, 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 okay. But that's very interesting. And this is also something which uh, I think we discussed that yesterday in our project uh, meeting, that um, project management is probably something that would be really good for us to also have a, as a, a kind of module in, a, in the curriculum, because yeah, it so often is combined to, uh, in the actual jobs that linguists get. So and thanks I, for- I can add on this that also from yeah. customer perspective, 
uh, when we have to send proposal, now more than in the past, they are interested in knowing how you handle projects uh, from a project management perspective. So they uh, send us like uh, tests about project management and not only about quality for translation or pricing, of course. And it's quite interesting. Lonica, yeah. do we have time for me to ask a brief comment, a little brief comment about the gender? Um, question that I mentioned briefly yeah. from a woman in the business. Yeah. Do you see this imbalance in in uh, in the industry with women mainly being freelancers and and having all the the sort of <laughs> high level jobs uh, with more men? Do you see that? Uh, well, actually, most of our employees are women. Uh, if we look at project managers in particular, uh, in Italy we have uh, forty project managers and the men are like three. Uh, and also on top management position, uh, we see more and more women. The head of production at Accolade Group, I mean, at the top level is a woman, is a woman. Wow, so, yeah, it's, it's a group. that's very encouraging as well. The yes. wind is changing. And I must say that um, what I see, I mean, at least from my experience that uh, being a woman, um, has never blocked uh, the career and also having kids. I personally have two kids. So, <laughs> uh, I mean, and it, it was not a blocker for the career. Great. Very good to hear that. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Okay. So I guess that we're ready now to go to the last speaker uh, of this series. Um, I wonder if Ilir is here. Yes. Can you hear me? Ah, yes, I can hear you very well. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me to join our uh, to join your session today. I'm Idira Sani Mabrici from Graz University of Technology. I have a background in computer science and I'm leading the research data management team at TU Graz. So we are part of a strategic project program from the rectorate with the name Digital TU Graz. So with this program, the rectorate wants to make sure that the digital transformation is well established in different directions. So not just in research, but also in teaching, in administration and third mission. And today, so my talk, it's a kind of zooming out now from all the topics that we heard and all the uh, to uh, speakers that we heard today. So the focus was on linguistic. And uh, I will give an overview of what is going to be on also in other disciplines. And I can just say that um, all these challenges that were mentioned uh, in, relate, uh, in regard to digital transformation, of course, they are, they are visible in all other disciplines as well. And um, here I, I allowed myself to cite uh, one of the speakers of the EOSC symposium that took place a couple of days ago. Um, and this gives really a nice overview of the trends in um, research and science. So as we know, the research is more is becoming more and more data driven. And this brings, of course, a lot of uh, opportunities, but also challenges. A data driven research enables us to collaborate with others and also to work uh, interdisciplinary. This means that we can move our research uh, must fast. We can move our research forward much, much faster. But this means also that there is a cultural change um, how research is being done. So the researchers have to move from working as focused experts with self-generated data towards data discoverability and structured cooperation. And this is possible only if we have a sustainable research infrastructure. So just as an illustration, if we work alone, of course, we can reach some of the fruits of the tree of the knowledge, but uh, this, this reach is, is limited. We need networks, we need collaborations to move forward. And especially we need an infrastructure, a research infrastructure to get at, at the top. And uh, many research institutions are now establishing these research infrastructures, and this uh, usually does not have to do only with the so-called hard infrastructure elements like 
uh, platforms for data analysis, repositories for archiving research data, but you have to have also so-called soft infrastructure elements. And data stewardship is playing a major role in this regard. So many research institutions are establishing uh, research, uh, data stewardship programs, and this is a new professional role. So data stewards um, are, are becoming a new role in the field of research data management. And so here I have just a, a, a diagram from a, a work that uh, I cite also in this slide. So usually they are a link between research infrastructure and policy. And they have an advisory role through the entire data life cycle, not just uh, up front of a research project, but also during data preparation, archiving, or, or reuse. And uh, align, aligning our uh, uh, activities with also national, international um, and developments, we in Austria, we are also establishing a data stewardship program for Austrian universities, and this is done in the frame of a national project with the name Fair Data Austria, which is funded by the Federal Ministry of Education, Science and Research. We have six core partners in this project and 23 associated partners. But of course, in our activities, we are trying to involve all the stakeholders. So we want to align our activities with the data stewardship efforts uh, on national and international level. And uh, our aim is to define data steward model, profiles, competences, and also training programs for the Austrian context. Uh, our uh, ultimate goal is to establish a self-assessment tool, which can be used also from the management of different institutions to identify a suitable model. So to match the requirements, for example, the university size, available resources, fields of expertise, with existing solutions, such as number of data stewards, which model can it be a centralized or, uh, or decentralized? These are just, just examples. And in this initiative, of course, we also faced uh, many challenges and they are related to also what I heard today, uh, because this digital transformation is introducing these new roles. And then there is no common understanding between different stakeholders, what these roles are. So what competences should the, the person that take these roles also have? And we realized that our partner universities, universities they had also different uh, stages of, of uh, development. So um, some, for some of them, there were people already doing the, the task that the data steward does, but they were named differently. So we needed some kind of uh, agreements to work in order to work further. Uh, we have now common understanding what the data steward role means for us. And uh, we had also challenging uh, challenges in communicating the need for data stewardship then to the management of the institutions. And uh, we experience as well in, in all the disciplines. So this is really almost discipline agnostic that there is a high demand on data science and programming skills. And now we are trying with our programs to fill, to fill this gap. So the data stewards will be um, building on these, these competences so they can help then researchers in different disciplines with data science and programming skills. There are of course, uh, all, as always uh, challenges uh, in funding these new positions, but many institutions are also thinking in repurposing the existing positions. Um, just for an illustration, so these are the, the models that are in discussion or that we identified for our context. So a university can have only one data steward. And of course, this person then can give just a general advice. So um, he or she cannot give like discipline specific advice, or there can be uh, up to min a minimum of three data stewards, and this can be like an office or, or a center. This is more like a centralized uh, model. Then you have a data steward network. And we as a university, we are moving towards this uh, model. So you would have one data steward at least for a faculty or for a field of expertise. 
and there has to be a coordinator which uh, makes sure that data stewards also work together. And of course, there are other models, more advanced one, for example, the University of Arizona, they have a so-called data science center. So there is a competence center within a university with a few data scientists, and they implement data-driven research projects with different faculty every year. I will just give you some um, overview uh, in regard to data stewards at Grass University of Technology. And here, just to have an idea um, how we are uh, set them down. So at our university, there are seven faculties and 97 institutes, and we have uh, approximately 2000 uh, academic staff. And um, just for uh, illustration, one third of our budget comes from the third party fund funding. And this means that we have a lot of collaboration with the industry. And we are realizing now that data stewards play a major role also in making sure that, for example, all the secret data and all the secret um, uh, results that are generated with the cooperation with the industry, that at least they are good documented and maybe to, to also raise awareness that some of the results can still be open for the community or the, the data can be published uh, based on the fair principles. Currently, we have three data stewards with different disciplines uh, backgrounds in mechanical engineering, physics, and life sciences. And of course, um, we also try to, to raise awareness in other disciplines as well. So the goal is to have in the upcoming three to four years to have also at least one data steward for all seven faculties. And uh, what do they do? So what are the tasks of our data stewards? So they interact a lot with infrastructure experts and with software developers. They play um, a major role in rolling out our research data management tools and services. They try uh, to build these competences in uh, the direction of data science. So they give support in data science tasks. Of course, they provide uh, continuous training for, for researchers. Um, they uh, contribute in network and community building. So we have also a so-called data champion uh, program at our university. And uh, they play a major role in uh, developing and implementing the faculty specific research data management policies. So uh, each faculty, we, we define these policies based on the faculty needs. And since you were also talking about the skills in different roles that you identified in, in your project, and we see those skills also um, in, in, in the role of data stewards. So the communication is really very crucial because they have to engage researchers. They have to manage different um, stakeholders. They have, of course, to facilitate meetings, trainings, workshops, and um, we realize that organizational skills are very also very important. So they have to understand how the university works. They have to understand how different processes work. Uh, teamwork is one of the competences that is really appreciated. And as we heard today, uh, technical skills and competences are becoming more and more relevant in all the disciplines like data processing, of course, data science competences, data management competences. We realize that data stewards have to be very flexible and they have to play a role also in the change management. So they have to raise awareness, they have to motivate researchers to, to do a proper research data management. And of course, they have to be good in, in problem solving. Here, I just wanted to provide one use case. It does not have to do with linguistics, so it's a really a heavy technical one, but I just wanted to show uh, in what kind of projects are our data stewards also involved. Uh, we have a big infrastructure project at our university. So there is a X-ray microcomputer tomography infrastructure being established at Ilgras, and this will be used from 13 institutes which are distributed also in other two Graz uh, universities. So University of Graz and Medical University of Graz. And of course, this in, in this infrastructure and all the studies that will be done here, 
uh, our um, waste uh, collections of data sets will be uh, produced as well. And there is a need for these data to be stored, archived, and accessed. Together with the team that uh, coordinates this project, our data stewards are developing a research data management strategy to ensure that the data will be fair before and after the publication. And we will provide researchers with a prototype so that they can work with it in order to, to make their research happen. All our tools and services that we are being also established will be used in, in this project. And with this, I will complete my talk. Thanks a lot. And I'm happy to answer any questions if there is time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very inspiring as well. I like the, yeah, the, the, the very first slide. I think a lot of people also uh, reacted enthusiastically in this chat. Uh, the data is a way of, you know, bringing us all together. And with uh, it seems definitely something that in the future will become more and more important. And it was very interesting to see that, um, yeah, at Graz, how you are uh, envisaging this uh, with these multiple data stewards. So um, very interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, in the chat, I was looking, I didn't see that many questions, just people being enthusiastic and also thinking along with what you were saying. Um, so maybe I can ask a question myself. I was wondering with these data stewards, so you were mostly talking about university. And I was wondering how do industries uh, fit in this picture? Are they also allowed to make use of the same data stewards or are they uh, doing their own, uh, uh, kind of have their own data stewards? How is this? Yeah. Uh, we are working also on a business model that will, will enable exactly this. So um, oh. our data stewards then will contribute to those uh, collaboration projects. And we have also some um, collaboration with other industry partners that they have so-called data stewards on their own. So they, um, they call also, they, these persons work in data governance actually. But uh, we see a, a really a high interest to work together with universities in order to share these, these positions. And I think this can be really, in regard to sustainability, this can be a business model that can really work. 